I am here with Kevin Zoe of Galoy Capital. Kevin, welcome to Entertain FM. You are one of the few non-cosmonauts on this podcast, and I know that you are an ardent POW supporter. Glad to be here. I want to run through your background because your history is really interesting. And just for the record, um, I was one of your first thousand or so followers before you really started making noise on Twitter. And I remember, I think it was Meltem's tweet or something that said, um, like, you know, who, which Twitter account is the most underrated um, Twitter account that has like a big brain behind it. And I was like, I know who Kevin Galoy Capital. And oh, then I boom. Appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for the all the early support there. So yeah, really appreciate that. Etymology of Galois. And and I think you pronounce it as Galois, right? Which is yeah. which is the French French pronunciation. I'm just being an American plebe pronouncing it wrong. You named it after Everest Galois. Is that right? The guy that founded um, group theory and finite, which is the precursor to finite fields, which is the precursor to cryptography as it stands. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we named our, our firm after a French mathematician. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, we were always going to name it after some mathematician and we were kind of like uh, choosing between a number of different names. Uh, my suggestion actually initially was, um, uh, Julia, uh, capital after Gaston Julia, uh, who did a lot of work in, uh, fractals. Um, and then there was also considerations for, for you know, Mandelbrot, uh, which I think is, you know, quite, quite a lot more relevant to um, quantitative finance. Uh, but, you know, such a mouthful to say. Uh, ended up with Galois. I don't know if that ended up being like the best name, honestly, because, you know, it's so hard to pronounce. And when you read it out in, in, writ in written form, uh, it's not obvious how to pronounce it. Um, but, you know, at this point, that's, uh, that's how we came up with the name. Right. So, and you wanted to pay homage to these mathematicians because you yourself are a quant. Is that right? Is that your background? Um, yeah. So both me and my co-founder were both uh, math guys. Um, so, you know, we thought, why not? Uh, uh, you know, and I also think, you know, as, as a way of um, sort of, I guess, you know, helping with recruiting and sort of telling people initially, you know, the first thing that people see is the name of the, of the firm. So, just letting them know kind of what we're about, um, you know, having a mathematician's name there, uh, maybe kind of, you know, helps with recruiting the right demographic of, of folks that we're trying to target. Right. People who are nerdy enough to know that this is a mathematician. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting about, about him is that he died at the very early age of, I think it was like 20, 21, mm -hmm. over, a, over like a gunfight. And it was over a girl, I believe. <laughs> it was, you know, and I think in retrospect, maybe not a good name to name a firm after, uh, you know, somebody <laughs> who died so young, because I, I definitely hope that we last a much longer time, you know. And, right. You know, we don't, we also don't die too early. You know, yeah. Way. And and you yourself are in a sort of veritable uh, gunfight online right now. Well, I guess that is true. So I guess we're just playing it out right now, huh? That's, uh, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't end the same way then, huh? I hope not. But, you know, he, he made it in history and he's remembered by progeny like like yourselves so yeah i, I, I mean, just imagine what he could have done if he if he lived uh you know much longer just uh, imagine right. how much mathematics he, he could have discovered and invented so uh you know a bit, a bit unfortunate there but hopefully we don't meet with the same fate yeah right so his claim in history is that you know before him there's a 350 year old problem that was unsolved until he came around and just created the solution mm -hmm. And that was the primitive for everything that we rely on for security and encryption today in crypto. Yeah, no, the guy was a young, impressive lad. So, you know, passed on too soon. Yes, very sad. So, okay, now that we know the etymology of Galois Capital, what's your background? We know you're a quant, but mm -hmm. it would be interesting to hear your story and how you got into crypto. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I started off my career as a client and, uh, you know, in 2011, I came across, um, uh, the Bitcoin white paper. I think it was the second, um, post about, uh, Bitcoin or linked to an article on Bitcoin, um, uh, on Reddit. 
uh, and it was the slash dot article. So, you know, I read that, I actually didn't think too much of it at the time. And then, uh, I guess over the next week, it kind of festered a little bit in my mind. And then I went, uh, went back to it, started going down the rabbit hole. And then ever since then was just completely hooked, uh, on crypto. And, uh, you know, that's kind of, kind of how I got my start, uh, for the first two years, really, um, not really joining the industry, just really training my own uh, PA. And then afterwards in 2013, uh, joining a small startup called Buttercoin. Um, it was uh, an early uh, crypto exchange. Um, two years later in the, in the winter of uh, uh, you know, 2014, 2015, um, ended up shutting down. So uh, that startup didn't make it. Uh, but from that you know, experience, I was able to land a job at Kraken uh, where um, you know, I was uh, I helped build out their trading desk. Um, and after that, another two years later, uh, decided to, uh, start Galois Capital, uh, with my co-founder. And, um, I guess the rest is, has been history. Um, you know, we, we primarily focus on, uh, Delta neutral strategies. Uh, we do a little bit of, you know, discretionary long short, um, but that's, you know, that's based the, the fund is I, I would say fairly low risk we don't really like taking too much directional risk so you know a lot of the stuff that um, I, i'm even talking about on twitter i would say is not uh super common uh that we even do um but you know it's just i think you know i think it's more interesting to talk about these long short ideas um rather than like truly market neutral strategies because uh, you know that stuff is still kind of dry and i think most people can't relate as much um so even though i tweet a lot about like uh, long short stuff. Um, we're actually mostly focused on on market neutral uh, uh, strategies. Yeah. Right, and when you say that, you mean bets in which are hedged. Is mm-hmm. that right? Okay. And yeah, why and which, you don't really have um, exposure to the underlying, right? So, like for example, like I guess one of the market neutral strategies um, or or plays that we did make was, you know, we we were. Uh, long each spot and short September or December, like quarterlies, for example, um, that would be like fairly market neutral. Uh, on the other hand, the other play that I talked about was like, um, you know, short ETH, long Bitcoin, that would not be market neutral because you you have like idiosyncratic um, exposure to two different assets. Uh, in what way? Well, I mean, like in the second case, you're short Ether and you're long Bitcoin. So it's like you are still exposed to the underlying sort of like relative price between those two assets, right? Mm-hmm. Well, Ether against Ether, for example, spot against uh, futures, that's, you know, much less risk. I see. Yeah. And where do you actually go to execute on these plays? Um, just across a number of different exchanges. So, you know, there's like FTX, Coinbase, um, uh, Binance, uh, a couple of other venues, uh, that sort of thing. I got it. So who are your equivalents in the crypto space like uh-huh. would with 3ac be considered sort of a competitor or uh i guess like laterally in the sense that they were a trading shop um but i would say like you know a lot of these kinds of firms um like 3ac like cms uh they're a lot more directional than us i think we're a bit more similar um, to, you know, like jump tower, like HRT, um, to some extent, like Alameda winter mute, um, you know, fast and hour digital, um, places like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like NBO, folk thing, like places like that. You, I would say shot up in notoriety very recently from being the sort of Luna crash whistleblower before it crashed. And then now being the sort of, uh, ETH merge whistleblower <laughs> as it is unfolding. Yeah, um, I would say, you know, I think the first one played out a lot better for us, um, at least for me. Um, you know, I think I think we really nailed that one on the head. I think with the ETH merge, I think that one was more, uh, well, I had two real main ideas. I think the first is that there's a lot of like merge risk <clears throat> that I thought people were not talking about and people were sort of like um, understating. And then the second was, uh, you know, is it priced in or not, right? Or is it like overly priced in? Is this like kind of like a sell the news uh, kind of event? <clears throat> so I think, you know, really on the first point, I was just trying to make the point that, you know, there's there's all this um, 
all these possibilities about what could happen when there is a fork, uh, like the proof of work fork, and you know how many forks could there be, and you know this, this, and that. And I think really it's like, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, possibilities. Most of them aren't going to play out. But I thought that even if some of them played out, that this would uh, materially affect like how we should be positioning ourselves um, going into the merge. And I, that's kind of what I wanted to share, uh, you know, on Twitter publicly, um, just to talk about some of these kinds of risks. Um, mm -hmm. I think like, you know, in some ways there were, there were some things that were just completely unexpected, right? Like for example, that, um, you know, Poloniex uh, decided that their ETHW uh, ticker was going to settle to Ethereum Fair instead of Ethereum POW, right? Which is like a different, Ethereum Fair is a different proof of work uh, chain to Ethereum POW. So, you know, like that, I mean, that's like not very expected. Nobody even saw Ethereum Fair coming um, at any point, um, it just came out of nowhere. Um, but still, it's within like the category of things where it's like, you know, there's all sorts of unexpected things. There could be multiple forks. Exchanges can play grifts where they just decide to settle certain instruments to to whatever, right? Like I, I initially thought that there was going to be a different third fork, uh, which would be like, for example, um, just original Ethereum, unforked Ethereum, without the difficulty bomb diffuse, without EIP-1559. Um, you know, redirected to some kind of multi-sig or partially redirected there. So, you know, even though it didn't happen exactly that way, you know, it was something that was a bit analogous to that. Um, so, you know, so that's like, I think the first class of um, types of considerations that I wanted to share. And then the second was about like, you know, why, why did we short um, ETH against BTC uh, before the merge? Um, and that was... Uh, and we actually closed it off. We actually entered into the merge uh, pretty flat. So like, but why did we do that? Well, it's because like generally there's this idea that, um, you know, everybody was just like trying to push this narrative that the merge is not priced in, that the, the price is going to go up after the merge, you know, and that once like there's this technical de-risking event, even though there's not much risk at all, right, that, um, that the price is just going to shoot up. And I, I don't think that that was the case. You know, I mentioned on, uh, a couple other podcasts that uh, really, you know, uh, it, it's hard to say. It's like, um, on one hand, uh, you have all this, you know, quote unquote capital on the sidelines that could enter um, and go long once the de-risking happens, right? The technical de-risking of the merge. And on the other hand, you have a whole bunch of mercenary and rotational capital that have been piling into this narrative trade, which will then rotate out uh, and search for a new narrative, right? And it's like, which piece of capital, um, which amount of capital is greater in effect, right? And, and it did turn out that the rotational capital um, had a greater effect. And some of this was also confounded with, uh, you know, equities uh, falling in the broader markets. But I think if you look at it in proportion, this is still definitely a sell the, sell the news kind of event. And, you know, once like, once a narrative has played out and it's done, then people are always looking for something else uh, to do with the capital. And th this was, you know, and this was a lot more prominent during the, the, the bull market where everybody's just like a rotator, right? You rotate to this, you rotate to that. Um, this narrative comes, this narrative goes. Um, and I, I think we still see a lot of that kind of behavior uh, right now in, in crypto. And I think to some extent it's a bit unavoidable because um, it seems like generally people really like to follow uh, influencers on what they're doing. I think this is exactly the reason why, like, you know, in a much broader and sillier sense, you have all of these like actual celebrities um, starting like NFT series, right? Because like at the end of the day, it does work, right? Um, but I think, you know, at the, when, when all is said and done and all is considered, like, is that really healthy um, that we still have these kinds of very reflexive dynamics, um, even during a bear market, right? Um, and I think really, until a lot of that goes away, I see it hard for us to build into um, a bull market because generally a lot of these influencers, uh, you know, regardless of like their intention, the, the effect is basically like some kind of like, you know, Pied Piper leading rats into a river kind of thing. You know what I mean? Like um, usually the outcome is not good for the followers, right? Like, like, like they're basically like following this leader at like lemmings off a cliff right? so uh, the leader does fine right because like if, if they're early 
um, then everybody goes in behind them. Um, that's generally fine. Uh, but I just think that that's um, just not, not healthy to have, particularly in a bear market, right? It's not healthy overall anyway. In a bull market, it's what causes crashes to begin with. It's what causes like, you know, people to lose their shirts. Uh, but in a bear market, even at this time, you know, I mean, I really, I don't really think it should be um, that way. I, I think the, the faster that we can get that out of our system collectively, uh, the faster that we can go back to up. So that's my thought. Let's say 10, 20, 20 years from now, market becomes super efficient at, at finding true value uh, of cryptocurrencies uh, just because it's, it's now, you know, so big and the entire market is multi trillions of dollars or the entire, you know, crypto market is that is that big. Is it at that point when we stop falling for these traps or are we never going to shake that off? Because I mean, if we look at stock yeah. markets, you know, I, I think there's still some of that there, right? Yeah, uh, definitely. So I, I think it just gets better. I don't think probably there's some there's some part of it that's just human nature that we can't get rid of entirely. Right. But I but I do think that at least what I've noticed is that generally the bottoms of bear markets are marked by times where narrative um, no longer works, right? And everything does come finally come back down to fundamentals from which it can build up, right? So to the extent that narrative still works, it probably means that we've not yet bottomed, right? It means that people still think, there are influencers who still think that purely from influence that they can get people to, you know, that, that it's not so much despair and desolation in the air that they can still get people to buy stuff after them by influencing them, right? Um, and I think that it's only when, you know, there's that all of that is gone, right? Like people are truly like, they're not gonna follow any influencers because everybody's broke and nobody believes anything anymore. Everybody's like deeply paranoid and cynical about everything uh, that that basically forms the bottom, right? Because it can't, can't really get worse from there, right? As long as people can continue to get burned, then basically, like at a meta level, there's a meta, meta narrative um, of just like how bad crypto is, right? And it's just like how everybody should like stay away from crypto. You only get burned, this, this, and that, right? So like as long as more and more people get burned in that way, um, then that'll, it'll continue to fuel that fire. And so I think only after people stop talking about how bad crypto is, that then like, you know, and then there's more of like a quiet period where people don't talk about it at all. And then after that, the people, ah, maybe crypto is good again, right? So it takes some time for that sentiment, I think, underlying, uh, you know, how retail thinks about the market uh, to really change. And really, I think, you know, especially in crypto, retail is the lifeblood of crypto. Um, so I think it's really important. Um, it takes some, I would say, about two to three years for to forget how badly they got burned the last time uh, and to come back. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of how I see it. At this phase in the crypto market, we are still kind of teetering on the cliff, but we haven't really fallen off yet. And after we fall off, there's going to be just a so slow sideways bleed for at least another year from my point of view from here on out before we kind of can resume a full on bull market. If we're still following the, cycl the, the cycles from the mm -hmm. last two bears and bulls. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly how long it'll take. I think it more has to do with sentiment and um, in investment capital entering on, in a layer of like infrastructure that then helps build out the next cycle, right? So like, for example, like a lot of the um, investments in, let's say like DeFi, for example, had to be made like a couple of years before uh, like DeFi summer in 2020, right? It, mm -hmm. Like all that groundwork kind of has to be laid out a few years in advance. So like this is basically right now, I think we're kind of in a time where, um, you know, we're seeding the next, the next, next hype cycle, right? Maybe the next, mm -hmm. the, the next hype cycle has already been seeded like a couple of years ago. The next, next one, I think is going to come from a lot of investments um, that, that are made uh, in this bear market. Um, so, you know, I, really hard to say how long it lasts. A lot of it's on, on sentiment also. Like, it's almost like the quicker things get bad, the quicker things will get good, right? And that's why, in my mind, it's a little bit like accelerationist, right? Like, in some ways, you can't prevent, like, these kinds of business cycles because of, like, the, the reflexive nature of the markets, because of, like, human nature, because of that thing. Uh, I'm wondering maybe we can speed it along. Maybe that's possible. Maybe it's not. 
uh, really, really hard to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts about the the meme that I believe was propagated mostly by Suzu that, you know, we are part of a super cycle. So if, you know, the fact that institutions with bottomless pits of money are coming in and investing in the space, that this thing is going to contract the amount of time that sentiment gets accelerated one way or the other, uh, and then, you know, changes from bear to bull and the other way faster than before in previous yeah, cycles. You, you know, the funny thing about super cycle is when I first heard it, I, I had a completely mis I had completely misinterpreted uh, what it meant. Um, well, what I thought that super cycle meant was that basically like there are times where you have like these double bubbles, right? Uh, like, you know, for example, in 2013, there were like, there was like a mini bubble in the summer and then the, the big bubble that popped in, in the winter. Um, and I thought like, you know, this 2020 and 2021 cycle would be like this super cycle as in it would just be like a normal cycle, but it'd be like two humps. Like it'd be like a two hump camel, right? Or it's just like two kind of like smaller bubbles within a greater like super cycle, right? So that's what I thought super cycle meant when I first read it, right? Uh, and then I later heard like Sue explain it and then he was like, oh, this is like the cycle to end all cycles. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I've, I've been just thinking about it wrong the whole time. So initially based on how I thought about it, yeah, I was like, oh yeah, it totally makes sense. This does seem like a double or triple bubble. Which uh, it did happen. Which did happen, right? Um, but then like later on, like this idea that the, the, the bubbles will go away, I don't, I don't think that makes sense. I, I think that you're always going to have these kinds of uh, bubbles just from human nature. But um, I think that the magnitude of them uh, is going to get diminished over time. Right. Um, so like, instead of going like 90% crash into like 50 X, right. Maybe it's like 60% crash into like five X. Right. So like, I, I think like these types of bubbles, um, you know, are still going to continue, but I think the amplitude uh, is, is just going to get uh, a little bit, uh, squeezed in. I, I don't know if I see that just because it depends mm -hmm. on the circumstances and the people that come in because, you know, if, if the theory is that over time, the amplitude is going to decrease. Empirically, I didn't see that that was the case because in 2015, it was, it, 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 we didn't see 90% crashes. And in 20 or 2018 that wasn't the case too it was just the sheer magnitude of the scale that we reached during this bull market was just greater than any other previous markets that that was also because of the you know the ponzi nomics right the ohms and the ohm forks and the thousand ten thousand percent apy um and it was just just more lending than than we've ever done before. You know, lending wasn't even possible before because because we didn't have DeFi in previous cycles. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so empirically, I've just I've just seen that the bigger the space got, the more volatile the you know the the greater the crash. Mm -hmm. But I guess it would depend on what kind of projects are coming out and like what they're what they have on offer, right? Yeah. No, I think that's a good point. Um, I definitely think that. The more reflexive the entire space is, the bigger the bubble. So, like maybe, maybe it's just to revise my idea there. Then maybe it really is the case that um, the magnitude shrinks over time, but sometimes can you know just blow out uh, if there's like mm -hmm. ultra reflexive cycles, right? Um, I, I really hope that there was a lot of lessons learned from yeah. like, like these kinds of ref super reflexive projects, and hopefully we don't have to go through the same level of mania. Uh, as, as last time. Um, I also think that one of the reasons that I think um, things do get better over time is because like once we go through like this kind of whole like Luna episode, right? Uh, first of all, at least in the short term, we're probably not going to try a similar design within like, let's say two or three years, but at least for like two or three years, like we can kind of put that thing to rest, right? Um, and then I think even in the long run, at least there's like something that's kind of imprinted on the collective kind of memory uh, of the space that, uh, you know, maybe something that like looks like that even a little bit um, will cause at least some red flags and some alerts um, to pop up in our collective minds, right? Uh, so maybe even for the long term, uh, e either of these kinds of ultra reflexive mechanisms need to get super, super complicated 
to which it's like impossible to reason about. Um, and then we think like, oh, maybe this time it'll actually work. You know, it never does, but maybe this time it'll actually work. Uh, or at some point, there's also like a getting smarter in the sense that, hey, maybe all of these designs just don't work. Maybe there's just something fundamentally just that we're, that we're missing pursuing these kinds of like rebasing style um, algo stable coins, right? Like maybe we're trying to be alchemist too much over here and, you know, turning, turning lead to gold kind of thing. Uh, maybe we just can't really be done, right? Um, mm -hmm. I also think that theory itself will get better over time. Like eventually people will come out with, um, you know, proofs and, and theories on why um, certain types of things, certain, you know, and it'll be very narrow. It won't be like things like directly related to the real world, but like a narrow subset of like maybe this exact type of stable coin, why it can't really work, right? And then like another, somebody else will come out, well, this another design, you know, this can't exactly work. And then like what's common between the two and then they can have a more general framework. Well, tokens of this design almost surely cannot work. Tokens of this design maybe have some chance, right? So it's sort of like eventually we start narrowing down the design space, even from like a pure theory perspective, um, uh, rather than having to like actually do these experiments over and over and over again. Uh, maybe maybe it's actually provable that some of them uh, are just like isomorphic to each other. And therefore, if one doesn't work and we've seen that, then the others like pretty much won't work. Right. So yeah. like, whether or not we can create those kinds of like relational, um, like kind of like diagrams or uh, just relations, um, you know, between two different types of stable coins that ultimately boil down to the same. Thing. Given that some of these things are objectively bad ideas, where mm -hmm. is the room for regulators to come in and say that that's the case versus where is there this reliance on doing your own research and putting it upon retail to understand that maybe they shouldn't put their life savings in this protocol that's built on sand that they don't yet know is built on sand yet. Yeah. So my personal thought is that I don't think there um, needs to be too much regulation here. I think just overall through the years, the space itself does get smarter and retail does get smarter. Um, and you know, once once somebody's been burned, they they're going to think twice um, before getting burned again. So, you know, I don't think it's that necessary um, to put too much like paternalism on it. I think it'll have too much of a chilling effect on innovation in the space. And as much as I really don't like things like you know Luna and Luna Classic and you know all these types of like, uh, and, you know, I guess to some extent like all of these types of like ultra reflexive mechanisms from the past, I think inevitably we had to have tried them right because no amount of theorizing and rationalizing and and, and to, you know just talking about stuff is going to resolve things right like that's one of the things that i talked about in, in the last blog post that i wrote about which is that like like reasons don't matter like reasoning doesn't actually matter right like when you're looking at like the forces that drive stuff in crypto like that's like reasons are very, fairly secondary like at the end of the day, until like we viscerally see it as an industry, there's always going to be contention and arguments between the different tribes about what works and what doesn't work, right? Which is why I think it's actually really good that Ethereum finally moved to proof of stake. So we can finally see how this thing plays out. You know, in some ways, it's better that they're not hindered or encumbered. Um, you know, after finally, after eight years, um, you know, the proof will be in the pudding and we'll see. We'll see mm -hmm. what Right. And how do you predict it's going to play out for ETH? I mean, I, I just want to kind of bounce some ideas off of you because I, I have my own thesis, but I want to hear yours first. Um, I think in the short term, it, it'll be fine. You know, it'll be just like any of these other proof of stake uh, chains, maybe a little bit better on the liveness side, maybe about the same. Um, I think in the long term, It'll be interesting to see. I'm pe pretty pessimistic. I think that uh, there's a reason that, you know, proof of work is very expensive. Um, and there's really one of two outcomes, right? Like one is that um, all along, Ethereum was overpaying its security budget. It didn't really even need these miners at any point. It was really overpaying for them, right? Um, maybe could have gone away with, with much, much less. Uh, or the alternative is all of this quote unquote waste 
all of this waste that went into the security budget maybe actually was necessary, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, now, there's always questions about, well, you know, some people might say, well, the security budget of ETH, uh, you know, it's just right now in proof of stake. I mean, it's a super high security budget, you know, like people have to stake all this ETH, um, you know, nobody can misbehave uh, or they get slashed, um, you know, this, this and that. And what I would say is that like, the, the real difference here is that the security budget for a proof of stake is ultimately like circular, right? Like the security budget is based on, um, you know, th this, uh, it's not based on the expenditure of value in the external world, right? Mm -hmm. it's yeah. Endogenous within the space. So you, you create basically reflexiveness. Um, I think that that's fine, right? Like so long as there really is demand uh, for block space, to some extent that, that that's fine, but you're going to have like, much greater volatility, right? Like based on like how much people demand block space, it's just going to be extremely, you know, volatile in terms of like what the security budget is, is at any given time, right? Well, I think for proof of work is a lot, it's a lot more steady, right? Because it's anchored into like, I guess energy costs these days are pretty volatile too, but you know, for the most part, less volatile, right? So you could get in, so with proof of stake, I think you can get into a bad situation uh, where, you know, demand for block space just starts plummeting and then security, you know, budget starts plummeting from it, right? And causes this kind of like uh, re re reflexive kind of cycle. Um, I just don't think that that's as safe, right? Like the, like the security budget of proof of stake right now is the opportunity cost of the staked ETH, right? Yep. To the extent that there is some opportunity cost, right? Like, like right now, your choices are, okay, you can stake up your ETH, right? Or you can keep your ETH liquid and use it for other things, right? So like if I, if, if you know, staking it, I'm going to get like 2%, 3% yield. If using it myself for trading, I get 5% yield. Then I would be one of the people not to stake it, right? Now, on the other hand, if my yield is only 1% and staking, I get 3%, well, then I'm going to stake it, right? So there's a natural equilibrium in the market between uh, people who have higher opportunity costs and people who have lower opportunity costs, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, basically that, that creates this kind of equilibrium of just how many people um, end up staking. Now, th this is under the situation that the, um, that the liquidity of staking derivatives uh, is a lot less than the, the, the you know, unstaked ETH, right? To the extent that everybody starts using like STE for trading, for collateral, for all these different things, right? Uh, then that's no longer the case. Then obviously now the equilibrium is, uh, you know, everybody should stake, right? Because your the opportunity cost is, uh, you know, so low, right? It's just like, uh, you know, um, even if you make just a little bit of interest, it's still good because it's just as liquid as unstaked ETH, right? Um, but anyway, the, the point that I'm trying to make is that um, ultimately, the security budget, right? To like really attack the network, right? You basically need to borrow a bunch of like staked ETH, right? Um, for a certain amount of time. So it's basically like the interest rate uh, on that. Uh, that's that's the opportunity cost of the ETH itself. So, you know, there's also issues, but you know, and this becomes like, this is one of the reasons why the system is like, uh, these kinds of systems are, are complicated is because you may you know some of these things are hard to reason about because now if you think about it well let's say staking derivatives get really liquid right um then it's like all of a sudden the opportunity cost uh for staking is much much lower right so does that like reduce the security budget by a lot like that's kind of crazy to think about right because then it's almost like to have something really good which incentivizes really high participation um in staking actually reduces the security overall of the chain right that's like that seems kind of counterintuitive but that seems to be the case right like in proof of work the security budget is all this electricity that's been been burned right in proof of stake it's the opportunity cost of the capital which is held there instead of being you know more liquid right so like what is that really, right? Like that's kind of circular on 
there being a use for that capital in the first place, right? And as long as that flywheel is always going, then it's kind of like fine, right? But if that ever like slows down or stops, or all of a sudden the opportunity cost to use ETH, that the next best use case of ETH um, is just is just now worse, right? Is just like lower yielding, um, then that reduces the overall security uh, of the network. The, the other concern that I have with the way that Ethereum is implementing their proof of stake is that it is much more susceptible to cartelization and then we have it um, becoming more of a plutocracy because when we hear news of uh, JP Morgan buying up large amounts of equity in consensus with a Y, you know, who knows if that buys them sort of, you know, one-to-one -one share of an Ether, for example. So if, if they're able to come in and then take their ETH, stake, steth, and have, you know, 20% of the voting power of the network, and it happens to be on Lido, then how many really need to come in to really take over the network and just turn the Ethereum public chain into their cartel? Um yeah, I'm actually not too concerned about that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll explain. But I think the sort of like the Bitcoin maximalists, you know, they have all these different lines of like argumentation, right? About like why like proof of stake is bad and why uh, proof of work is good. Uh, I, I actually I agree with them on the conclusion. Like I do think that proof of work is better. That's my personal opinion. But I I think that some of the arguments they make are a bit straw manning, right? It's a bit of straw manning. Like I think that you know, in in a way like there is going to be more of like this kind of like plutocracy in the sense that like if you have it such that the stakers are the ones that you know validate all the blocks um you know this this and that then like the only way that people can get a greater share is by buying more of the thing right as opposed to like for example with mining you can either buy more of the thing or you can mine it yourself right but i think practically speaking mining itself is already quite centralized and it's such a business at scale that like a, a random like singular individual is not going to just then go set up his mining shop as an alternative way to getting bitcoin they're just going to buy it in the market anyway right? um so i think for the most part um they're about the same level of centralization there's some arguments to be made that even the proof of stake is actually a little bit less centralized and i actually buy some of those arguments from from the ethereans um i think they make some good arguments there I don't really think that that's really what the issue is uh, with with proof of stake. Like as far as like the validators and stuff like that, uh, you know, doing some kind of OFAC chain, this, this, and that. I don't really think that's that's a big deal. They're gonna just like they're gonna slash them. They're gonna have their own uncensored chain and fork those guys off into their own chain. Um, that's not as risky. The really risky part, I think, is um, the, all the stable coins that are on Ether, right? Because it, it, it's one thing for a validator to not behave according to social consensus. I think generally the threat of slashing mostly I think is good enough. Like, like me, it's like almost, it's almost good enough or good enough in my opinion. But I think um, when you have like, let's say like circle or tether, if they get a lot of pressure to say, okay, now all these um, dollars that are in this bank account can only be redeemed on the OFAC chain, right? Now all of a sudden you have a huge splitting of value uh, you know when when ethereum forks right where you, where you have like an uncensored chain and like a censored chain right then you can have like some very serious splitting of value i think it was just the validators that were um, enforced against by the government pretty much you know almost all the value probably would stay with the uncensored chain uh, but you know with the stable coins you know then it gets a lot more messy so i'd say like that's that's a much bigger risk i think on the censorship side um than, uh, than the you know, validator misbehavior, validator centralization, this, this, and that. Maybe in the long run, all that stuff matters too. But I think, you know, at least in the medium term, I'm not as concerned about that. I'm more concerned about, you know, just the underlying, like what exactly is proof of stake? It's basically a circular kind of opportunity cost as a security budget. Um, uh, that, that, I think, is more core of what I think is wrong with proof of stake. Um, or at least very dangerous. It's not even that it's wrong. It's that it's just more dangerous. It's just more reflexive and self-referential, right? Um, if it's if if it's like 
it's like hard to balance on a bike when it's not moving, right? But as long as the bike just keeps going really fast, then it's easy to ride a bike. Um, maybe it's like that. Maybe it's actually okay, but it's definitely more dangerous, right? Like if you want to, if you want to go really, really slowly on a bike, uh, the chances of teetering over are, are, are much higher. Do you imagine that in an OFAC chain situation where the on and off ramps are compelled to go through that chain, that because the barrier of entering and leaving is so high, that maybe it's just going to further catalyze the adoption of crypto and DeFi because no one just wants to to leave after that. They just want to keep using the permissionless chains and never going back into fiat space. Yeah, I, I think there could be some of that, you know. I, I think it'll be very sh short term, very painful, but probably eventually all the you know value migrates back to the uncensored chain. Um, mm -hmm. At least most of it. Maybe there is some permanent hit because you just don't have like like real like uh, tethered stables anymore on Ethereum, right? Or like like wrap Bitcoin, like stuff like that. Um, I don't know if there is a good replacement for that. Um, but maybe, yeah, maybe there's, you know, at least, at least I think it'll be mostly fine, right? Like there's going to be a, a, a period of massive turmoil and then I think it'll be mostly fine, uh, for Ethereum, but maybe with just like, there's just no more stable coins that work basically on Ethereum. I, I actually, I'm actually more worried about the fact that people will probably try to solve this problem by inventing new algo stable coins, right? Because all of a sudden centralized stable coins no longer exist on the uncensored chain. And then that's going to cause more damage than not actually having stable coins uh, mm -hmm. on the chain. Uh, yeah. I, actually, I actually prefer, I think it's totally fine. I think Ethereum would be fine without centralized stable coins on it. I think it'll still be okay. Maybe, maybe it's like a permanent hit of like 10 to 20% in like the super long run. In the short term, oh, it's going to be ugly, right? It's maybe it's like 50, 80% hit. Um, but, you know, in the long run, maybe only 10, 20%. I think. It's, it's not even that bad. In the long run, and this is what no one talks about, which is using Bitcoin or ETH as the recur reserve currency that they could have been. You know, if you remove stable coins out of the equation, then if people had to exit out of their altcoins and and put it into something that's harder, they can uh, put it into Bitcoin, right? Instead of USDC or whatever, if these stable coins go down. And then that could lend itself to Bitcoin and ETH's long-term value being more stable and less volatile. Um, yeah, you know, it, I think that's totally possible. I think how funny would it be that really the ETH transition of proof of stake ultimately ends up benefiting the Bitcoiners, right? Yeah. I think that would be very ironic. Um, but, you know, I think left to be seen. I, I think um, I think at the end of the day, I think I think the intentions of both sides uh, are good, right? And I think there's just some fundamental ideological differences. But I do think the intentions of both sides, uh, you know, the Ethereans and the Bitcoiners are good. Uh, there has been i don't want to stoke the flames of this like kind of tribal warfare right now i think this is this is particularly a time where that's it's not so good for that right because i think i think really uh we're entering the true they fight you phase you know what i mean mm -hmm. uh, you know they being uh you know the current kind of uh, money system um so i think it's it's a time where we need more um solidarity and unity within the space and there's been just so much bad blood uh you know spilt over the years uh, between these two communities. I, I wonder if it's possible, but I, I do think that if there is a greater external threat, um, that at the end of the day, uh, crypto people are still crypto people that we would all band together. And I think it it helps that I think there are some people that are in the middle. Um, you know, I think that helps that, you know, you have people like, uh, you know, Udi, um, Nick Carter, Eric Wall, um, some folks that are in the middle that are willing to kind of like speak for both sides a little bit and try and and I think Eric Voorhees kind of was one of the original guys who uh, was like that um, to, you know, really try and like um, try and be impartial about things to try and say that, you know, in some ways we're all in it together uh, when faced with an external threat. It doesn't seem that way because it's so PVP right now. Uh, there's no, no real way to grow market share uh, because no new money's entering. So we just got to like fight each other for 
market share. We everybody needs to fight each other. But I, I think um, I think hopefully that comes to an end pretty soon. I, I think some amount is very healthy because if you don't have some tribal warfare, things get too stagnant, right? Um, on the other hand, too much of it and it gets a little bit destructive. Ultimately, is like detrimental. It becomes like prisoner dilemma situations where it's like both sides are defecting. It's like worse for both, right? So it's like, can we at a large scale have some kind of cooperate, cooperate outcome, uh, some three three outcome uh -huh. at the social layer? Uh, you know, when faced with a greater threat, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. You know, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I think we can. It's just that right now, uh, there's there's not enough cohesion for us to have that 3-3 outcome and we are seeing that we're having the 0-0 outcome play out unfortunately the tragedy of the commons right yes. which, is, which, which is you know every individual who's been in the space for long enough knows how the game is played and it is more optimal for them to act selfishly than it is to act cooperatively so they're going to launch their own shit coins or whatever or you know like do the Richard Hart thing right yeah. <laughs> and I think with the shit coiners and people who want to do those kinds of um, grifts, uh, there's no way really to align them, right? We're just going to have to deal mm. with it. But I think between the bigger communities of like Ethereum and Bitcoin, I think there can be some alignment. Because even though, you know, the actual, you know, obviously the game sort of game theoretic outcome for Prisoner Dilemma is a uh, defective defect, um, that's only for like a single, you know, one, one off, uh, you know, simultaneous game. But if you have like, a series of you know these kinds of simultaneous games you know uh this kind of repeated game structure maybe not the case right because like it would just be a really bad outcome i think for 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 the entire space if like the the bitcoiners are pushing for oh ethereum's a security right and the ethereum guys are pushing for oh bitcoin destroys the environment right yeah that's bad really against no side is winning here. Yeah. there's an arms escalation here um and I think that probably when it comes to things like that, right, when it comes to appealing to greater powers and state actors to enforce against competition, it's against the ethos of crypto. At the end of the day, I think the Bitcoiners are, uh, and the Ethereans are right in thinking that their chain will beat out the other one in the open market. But I think it should be left at that. I don't think it should be pushed beyond that to say, not only would we win in an open market, but also we're just going to stop them from even being possibly a threat and possibly winning by just throwing roadblocks in front of them through the use of, you know, uh, state or governmental, um, you know, faculties. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think that, and, and and best to keep war cold. That's what I'm saying. I think between these two tribes, at the end of the day, you don't want hot war uh, between these two tribes. And escalation is bad in that sense. As somebody who sits in between, I don't see it being helpful when some random Bitcoin maxi goes on CNBC and says, you know, Ethereum is is a security and therefore it should be regulated and Bitcoin is not. That's not helpful at all. If you were the government, like how would you approach this problem, right? Let's say you're trying to like stomp out crypto. Well, you would try and divide and conquer, right? Yeah, you would stoke the flames. You would stoke the flames, definitely. It's just like Democrats versus Republicans. Whoever is in, in power is very adept at uh, stoking flames, causing mass confusion, propagating FUD and propaganda, and further dividing both sides to be radical ends of either. So if they came into cryptocurrency and and played their game on us, you know, we would be just as susceptible to be even more entrenched in our ways and not come together. Yeah, especially given the, the history between those two tribes in particular. The thing that worries me um, about Ethereum POW is that Vitalik proposed a pop-up box for validators that suggests to you which chain is the true chain tip. Now, given that there's not going to be any objective measure of how uh, a chain tip is decided on, right? So they're just going to go with the chain tip with the most social consensus. He wants it to fall back on, on Reddit. Yeah, I think that's pretty concerning uh, to even suggest that. Um, but that being said, I actually don't think the Ethereum community would accept that. Um, I think at, at this point, um, regardless of the differences between Bitcoiners and, and Ethereans, for the most part, um, both are decentralization maximalists, uh, at least to a fairly strong degree, maybe not maximalist, but to a very strong degree. So 
I think there's a, there's a, I think at this point there's even a limit to what Vitalik can suggest, um, and if it's unpopular enough, I don't think it'll be uh, adopted. I, I don't think the majority of the capital in Ethereum would agree to go along with something like that. Now that being said, like I don't think it's necessarily bad on the client side, right? As long as there's client diversity, for some of them to choose that method, right, of coordination of having a dialog box. As long as not all of them do it, right, and as long as people are free to choose uh, between the different clients, if let's say only like 15, 20 percent of the clients have this dialogue box, probably it's okay. You know, when you get to about like 30, 40, 50 percent, you know, and then it's starting to get worrisome. Um, so I think the community might accept some lower threshold, but once like there's too much of this. I don't even think the community would accept it, even if it was Vitalik who said so. But at the same time, how many how many people are running these clients out of all of the civil validators that they have? So it's it's only yeah, a handful I don't know. of people. It's, it's the whole thing is pretty tricky. One of the maybe other dangers that's you know maybe related to this about proof of stake. Um, I don't know if I you know completely agree with this exact argument, but maybe something that's related to it is that um, because proof of stake is not uh, well, I guess maybe to take, take a step back, like, why do people, you know, why do people create coins that are proof of stake to begin with, right? At least in sort of like the modern era of crypto, that has been like, um, sort of like the, the, the most common new coin is some kind of proof of stake coin, right? Um, and I think that that's because it's actually kind of hard to set up all of the mining, right? Like, it's kind of like a shortcut. If you're able to just like set up a coin without having to get buy-in, from all these miners without having to deal with hardware, it's a lot easier to issue your new coin, right? So people are kind of like skipping this step. They see it as unnecessary. Um, but I think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's like, because proof of work requires mining, um, you know, you have like, you know, like Dogecoin and Bitcoin, like there, there are some very real, real world costs um, that are involved in the history uh, of the chain, right? Well, for proof of stake, it's like there's a lot more like kind of substitution effects because if someone comes up with a better mousetrap, they can just launch their coin and now it starts cannibalizing on all of these other proof of stake coins, right? Because you can literally just kind of like mint the initial uh, amount out of thin air. Like I, I think Ethereum is a bit in the middle, right? Because at the end of the day, it did start off as proof of work, right? A lot of the seniorage that did come from, you know, almost all of it really, right? At this point came from the proof of work era. Uh, very little of it came from the proof of stake era, which, you know, we'll see, we'll see how long it goes, right? Um, but for any like true proof of stake coin from the very beginning, right? You know, you're gonna have a lot of substitution effects because like all these other proof of stake chains, if they come up with a better mousetrap, they can also mint their coin out of thin air and then cannibalize on your market share. Right. Well, for, for proof of work, you know, that's not really the case. There's so much build up that has to happen in, in the meat space. Right. So that's kind of how I see it is that really like proof of work truly has supply caps. Right. While proof of stake, you know, even though this coin is supply capped, the next coin kind of has substitution cannibalization effects when they issue their next coin. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not it's not sound in that sense. Right. I think that gets a little bit to sort of what you were saying, that maybe it's slightly different kind of argument. I would say it's somewhere between the gold standard and fiat. And the reason I say that is because like at the end of the day, still the supply and the issuance is algorithmically controlled, right? Um, it, it can't, it's not just like, a, you know, for the most part, at least, it's not just like a small room with a couple of people deciding, you know, where, where the money supply is gonna go, right? Um, so I, I think, I do think it's already better than fiat, you know, I will say that, you know, as much as uh, I do prefer proof of work, I think even proof of stake is better than fiat, right? But it's just, um, my, my issue with it isn't really these kinds of things. Um, it's more about, you know, substitution effects from other proof of stake chains coming on. Um, and them, and, and it still could work, right? Because if the network effect is strong enough, and it is the last network, right, then the substitution effects won't be that great. Right. Like if it's the like if Facebook is like or like Google is like the last search engine, then it's just like competitors that come later don't really cannibalize on it like too much. Right. You have like, you know, DuckDuckGo and stuff like that. But for the most part, they retain their market share. It's not really that bad. Right. Um, 
So, you know, I, I think, you know, that, that part of the argument is about substitution effects, but maybe it doesn't play out. Maybe Ethereum is fine, can just ride on its network effects. It'll be okay. And then the other thing uh, is about, um, you know, just fundamentally the circular nature of what the security budget truly is. Right. Um, so th those are really my issues of proof of stake. It's not really a lot of the, you know, the other, the other, the other points that I think a lot of the Bitcoiners make may or may not play out, but I don't think gets to the core of what's really the issue of proof of stake. A lot of times, and I think this is a little bit bad on, on sort of like the Bitcoiner side, which is like they try to grasp at any type of argument um, that is for their side and like against Ethereum. Well, I think that in some ways the Bitcoiners, and for the most part, I'm more of a Bitcoiner uh, than Ethereum. I actually, I actually own a bit of both, uh, but I definitely own a lot more Bitcoin. Um, but what I was saying is that I think that they should really try and iron man the arguments um, that uh, the Ethereans are making and really just like where in doubt, maybe just give them the benefit of the doubt and try and try to really figure out at its core, like what's what's going on between proof of work and proof of stake. And that's at least what I've reasoned to, because I think that really the core issue is the circularity of the security budget. And it may not actually even be an issue, but it just makes things more dangerous. All of these things make it more dangerous, right? So I think that's really what, what my contention is. Like be fair to like Vitalik, for example, right? He wrote the uh, April Fool's blog post about like, oh, why proof of work is better than proof of stake. And I think you really got to give it to him in the sense that he, he fully understands very well the Iron Man arguments from the proof of work side, right? And I think that the Bitcoiners should do him the same courtesy to try and fully understand the arguments from the proof of stake side and not really make straw man arguments, not really just poke at any possible small crack or hole, but really get to the fundamentals of like, what is, why is proof of stake truly better than, than uh, proof of work truly better than proof of stake, right? So that, that's, that's, that's my thought. I think, I think it's important for both sides to be very fair with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you're one of the first people I've talked to who does cite the circular nature of proof of stake, mm -hmm. um, you know, because usually the, 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 the arguments for proof of stake is that it offers you higher throughput and it is uh, less, you know, energy intensive, give or take. It is more green, you know, <laughs> give it to them for that, right? For sure, it's more green. I guess you could make the moral argument that that's good for the planet and therefore it's going to attract more capital into the system. I think that's a bit loose. I, I, I don't think people care about the planet as much as people say. Um, but I, I don't agree with that at all. That's completely hypocritical yeah. because yeah. because we, we look at cat videos all day and night, cat and dog videos, and, and right. those that's even less that takes more energy than than all of uh, proof of work combined. I, yeah. I think it does. I, like I, I think the uh, energy expenditure for proof of work is perfectly fine. Like I don't think that that's a problem at all. Yeah. You know. Um, the entire the entire energy expenditure of the Bitcoin blockchain is less than U.S. domestic running of washing machines. Yeah, and I think it's probably even more important. Well, I don't know. Washing is way okay. more important. Yeah, I, I, the money system is way more important, right? Like, if we yeah. really think about it. So, like, no, I definitely agree with that. But all, all I'm saying is, like, I do think it's a fair argument that the Ethereum's make that now their system does consume even less electricity than all the washing machines, much less electricity than the washing machines okay. of uh, of the world. So in that way, it is greener. And what my point is that, but at the end of the day, like, has there been something that has been sacrificed for that, uh, which I think there has? And second, how much do people really care about the planet? I think I think people talk about caring about the planet. I think I think they kind of do, but, but nobody really wants to pay those costs, right? Mm -hmm. Like. Publicly, people always say that they do. Privately, I don't think people care as much as they lead on. Um, and I think, even to your point, even more so, uh, at the end of the day, there are some things that are more important than slight damage to the planet, right? Which is to have like a sound money system. With, with that, I mean, obviously, we you know we can even develop better technology to terraform the earth or whatever uh, to just make the environment better. You know, there's there's other ways of going about it, right? So, you know, I, that on that point, I definitely agree. And I'm definitely not knocking on proof of stake. You know, I, I work on a proof of stake project, but if you're trying to be sound money, uh -huh. I believe proof of work is the way to go. And you, you definitely lose those same properties if you're 
uh, if you if you move to proof of stake, if that's what you're gunning for. I, I do think so too. You know, I think a money system should be basically a pet rock um, that does nothing. Uh, I think it's it, it is better that way. I actually think a lot of the Bitcoiners are going down the wrong path of trying to do like smart contracts and build layers on top of uh, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think any of that really matters. I think just the simple orange rock, heavy rock is the way to go. So the simpler, the better. I, I think it's actually important that, you know, a currency's demand doesn't fluctuate based on demand for its consumption and use for other things um, that much, right? Like you can use gold for a bunch of different things like in like circuitry, um, you know, as jewelry, you know, to some extent, the jewelry use case is already kind of like a money use case, uh, right? It's like a display of the money, right? Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think it's actually good that it's not used for too many things, right? That its use value is so low. Um, and I think the same thing for, for Bitcoin. Um, so, yeah, I definitely agree that I think that a sound money system, I find it as more sound and safer to consider that as money uh, than something like Ethereum, which also has all of these oil kind of use cases that can be burned for all of these different apps, um, you know, for, for fees, for or whatever, for, for computation, um, for that sort of thing. So yeah, I definitely agree. And, and uh, I even think for the Bitcoiners, they don't, they don't need to go and compete with Ethereum on the tech thesis. And I actually think that even for the Ethereans, I know that eventually they do want to compete with Bitcoin for the money thesis, but I just think tactically in the short term, they shouldn't pursue that line. Um, they should really, you know, just take over the tech thesis and then undermine Bitcoin on the money thesis later if that's what they want to do. I think in the short term, they want to avoid escalations. And also, I, uh, to be fair, it's not, you know, the Ethereans probably <laughs> deserve less than half the blame for escalations. I think the Bitcoiners are particularly aggressive in trying to slam Ethereum. Uh, so to, to be fair to the Ethereans, I think the Bitcoiners should also, at this time, lay off temporary truce they can get back into it later. Maybe I can give so, sort of my thoughts on some of the reasons I think that the a lot of the Bitcoin maxis are very aggressive and toxic. And I think it's really two core reasons. The first is that is the simple one, right? Which is that at the end of the day, they are worried about Ethereum, right? That they're not so confident and sure about their own system that they think that they need to impede or hinder Ethereum. So and out of fear, they want to prevent it from happening so that Bitcoin wins in the end, right? And I think that this is a bad line of thinking. I think if they really believed in it, then in an open market, it'll just outcompete Ethereum. Everything will be fine. You don't need to impede Ethereum's progress in order to do so, right? And I think that's a that's a more honorable and a more just way of going about it, right? Because if Ethereum wins in the end, then it does deserve to win, right? Let's like be fair about it, right? I think the second though, uh, the second argument, though, is, is actually more more funny and more interesting, which is like, at the end of the day, what do the Bitcoiners actually do? Well, they basically hold a really heavy rock and they watch paint dry and they watch grass grow. Right. The whole the whole thesis of how to play Bitcoin is you just buy this thing, you hoard this thing, you just wait and do nothing. Right. I think that's correct. But obviously people get really restless. Right. There's just nothing to do, not, not much to talk about, you know, not many, not many developments. Half the developments aren't even good, right? Like, and most, almost all of them aren't even necessary, right? Like Taproot, to some extent, even Lightning, I started to say so, Joseph, you know, I, I don't even know just how even necessary all of these things are. I think Heavy Rock, hold it and hoard it is perfectly fine. But obviously, like, then it's just like, there's nothing to talk about, right? So like, out of listlessness and restlessness, they just find something to attack, basically, right? It's just out of sheer boredom. There's nothing else to do, right? Um, and, you know, there's just a lot more to talk about in Ethereum because you have all this development, that development. You know, I, I always say that, uh, I always have this saying that it's like Bitcoin um, solves a problem correctly. And this, but this problem, uh, most people don't think exists, right? Which is like the money system problem, right? Ethereum tries to boil the ocean, right? Um, not literally, but like figuratively, tries to solve all the ailments and all the problems of the world. Besides just the money system, there's all these other things that need fixing, right? The world is imperfect in a, in a grand play towards utopianism. We got to fix all this other shit, right? Uh, life, life is bad. We can make it better, right? Uh, the intentions are good, right? Uh, the problem there is that 
Uh, the problems do exist. It's very clear that these problems do exist, at least for the most part. So, you know, we might even argue about whether some of these problems exist. For the most part, most people agree these problems exist. Now the question is, do the solutions actually work, right? So I think Bitcoin is like a correct solution for a problem that may or may not exist. Uh, most people don't think exists. Ethereum has a whole bunch of bad solutions for problems that do exist, right? And maybe a few good ones, right? And I think that's really kind of like the dividing line. But because the problems addressed by Ethereum are much more tangible, and there's so many of them, not just money itself, right? I mean, so many of them. Um, there's just a lot more to talk about. And that's why there's just more, you know, in some ways, more of an active and vibrant community. While the Bitcoiners basically holding their rock, right? And that's it. <laughs> Every, everybody's like, you still holding your rock? Good. Are you still holding your rock? Good. There's nothing left to talk about, really. You know, we're all on the same page. We're all holding our heavy rock and we're just waiting and biding time, right? So it's kind of boring, right? It's kind of boring. Um, and I think this is also why there's a bit of a demographic split between um, younger people and older people. Now, we're all pretty young in crypto, right? It's like the late and mid millennials or early millennials versus the like late Gen Z and early millennials in Ethereum, right? And I think this is also very characteristic of, um, you know, young people versus like slightly older people and that young people generally have this kind of drive and this kind of energy to go about and with this optimism, try to solve a lot of the problems of the world. And I think, um, you know, the intentions are good. I think they're a little bit misguided in some of their attempts, but I think the intentions are good. Well, I think for older folks, in some ways, they have a little bit more perspective, um, maybe a little bit less optimism, maybe a little bit less energy, right? And I think that's kind of why you have these kinds of like dividing lines um, between these, these two communities. Um, I think these, a lot of these utopian pursuits uh, will end in tears, uh, but that's, that's my personal thought, right? Like there's a question of whether or not these pursuits are worthwhile, even if most fail. And it is possible that they are, right? It is possible that even if one out of 10 succeeds, even if one out of 50 succeeds, that it was worth all of the failures, right? Uh, in the pursuit of all these utopian ideas. If we can even get one partial utopia, maybe that's already good yeah, for one specific subsector um, that we found a use for a distributed database outside of just money itself, um, then maybe that's like, that's okay, you know? So I don't wanna, I don't wanna rag on that too much. I think, you know, a lot of the progress in the world does come from people, whether naively or not, believing in something uh, and trying to pursue it and make the world a better place. So I also don't want to hinder that. Um, but at the same time, I also hold in reserve my own skepticism, of course. Well, do, you, do you think that this observation you've made about Bitcoiners also applies to gold bugs? Because we see the same exact tendency coming from Peter Schiff against the Bitcoiners. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Someone exactly. who's an ardent gold bug who exactly. who just like hoards physical rocks. Yeah, same that's exactly thing. the same idea. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's also why uh, the gold bugs are a little bit vitriolic and also why they're also seen as kind of crazy, right? You're uh -huh. seeing a lot of the parallels uh, to the Bitcoins. It's basically the same thing. And then, you know, then you have like the whole shift versus the Bitcoiners uh, debate. And it's just like, my heavy rock is better than your heavy rock. Like at the end of the day, if the rock is heavy, it's fine. You know, it's fine. I agree that we need heavy rocks. Does it really matter? You know, there, well, obviously Bitcoin is better, but, you know, he's wrong. But, you know, but that being <laughs> said, like, it's really of the same camp, really. Like, this is all just infighting, really. This is, all, this is all just family disputes at the end of the day. Even between Bitcoin and Ethereum, it's all just family disputes at the end of the day. Just so we could segue to your utopianism versus grift framework, uh, I want to talk about that because when I read your state of the market blog post, I thought that this framework was really interesting because it's it really um, categorizes the types of grifts um, the new projects are coming out with. So. So yeah, I, I do want to talk about that. I'm going to share my screen here just so people know what I'm talking about. On the upper quadrant, the quadrant two and quadrant four, you have more utopianism. On the left side, you, you have lower grift. On, on the right, you have higher grift. And on the quadrant one side, I would say 
that's Bitcoin, right? Ethereum yeah. would be in quadrant two and something like, you know, Terra Luna would be uh, quadrant four. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, roughly, I think that's, I think roughly right. Um, what, what I would say is that um, in the very bottom left corner, I actually wouldn't put Bitcoin. I would put like real picks and shovels businesses mm -hmm. um, built in crypto, right? So where it's like, we don't even need to make any assumptions about the future to see that right now there's a demand for a certain thing, right? Like, so for example, like a legitimately run exchange would be bottom of quadrant, uh, lower left-hand corner quadrant one, right? You're built, you basically have a toll bridge, you keep the customer's money in a safe way, um, you collect the fees that people you know, pay you uh, when, when, when they make trades, right? It's like very picks and shovels. It's very obvious where the revenues are going to be coming from. Um, you know, it's very obvious that it'll work at scale. Um, we don't need to invent or have any you know, mental leaps as to why this thing will work. Um, I would put Bitcoin in quadrant one, but a bit higher up, right? So mm -hmm. a little bit closer to quadrant two, but still in quadrant one. Um, and that's because to some extent, it still requires a tiny bit of utopianism to think that still this still fledgling project will eventually, you know, realize yeah. its green vision of becoming like the reserve currency of the world, you know, all these yeah. different things. Um, so left to be seen. I think eventually as that plays out, it becomes more and more uh, in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, but as of right now, still even then some questions, even about for Bitcoin, whether or not it will succeed. I do think so. I do think it'll migrate there uh, personally, uh, but to be fair to where it is right now, there is still some utopianism, even in Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. Now, that being said, comparatively, of all the coins, it's probably one of the least utopian, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe with the exception of exchange tokens, right? The exchange tokens maybe are less utopian than Bitcoin because it's just like, oh, we make some fees, uh, we buy it back on the open market. That's the burn, right? Like, it's just like, it's just, you know, it doesn't require any leaps of, of belief at all, right? Um, so besides the exchange tokens, probably Bitcoin is the least utopian of all of the different coins. On Ethereum, yeah, I, I would say that uh, you know it's not very grifty. Uh, it's you know I think solidly quadrant two. Um, as they overcome technical hurdles uh, and they're able to realize their grand vision, they migrate more to, to quadrant one. And even as they fail their grand vision, they migrate to quadrant one, right? Because basically, what what causes utopianism to evaporate? is to see whether or not things actually play out. Whether they play out or not doesn't actually matter, right? Because, but once we know how things will play out and how they do play out, then we know what Ethereum is, right? And we can finally define what it is, right? Whether it's like ultra scaled world computer or not very scaled world computer or ultra scaled world computer that's also money, all these revelations have to come later. But for any of those cases, once those revelations are made, then it becomes solidly quadrant one, right? So e even if it fails, it just like, it fails its scale and scope, but still it is no longer utopian because nobody believes beyond that what it can do, right? People know exactly what it can do, right? Um, so that would be kind of like Ethereum. Um, I personally would definitely put uh, Luna into quadrant four. Uh, I do think that it was a very heavy grift and very, very heavy in utopianism. Most algo stable coins, I think, are extreme on the utopianism uh, uh, scale. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that, that ended up not working out. Um, the whole thing collapsed. And, uh, you know, I think it was good that it collapsed when it did. Earlier would have been even better. Um, later would have been even more devastating. So uh, that's one that was not able to migrate itself from quadrant four to any of the you know, it's quadrant two or quadrant one. Um, I think um, there are some cases where you have like projects that started off as a grift, but then incidentally become so successful that later on try to legitimize themselves and uh, basically, uh, you know, clean themselves up and migrate from quadrant four to quadrant two or quadrant four to quadrant one. Uh, those are extremely rare. Those are extremely rare. Uh, but I think those do happen. Luna was not able to do that. So yeah, that's kind of my assessment of those three projects you mentioned. Is there any project you can think of that did do that? The closest thing that 
comes to mind, ironically, is <laughs> this is so silly to say because I don't endorse this coin at all. For the record, I don't think I would ever hold this coin, right? But I think to some extent, Tron is a little bit like that. Oh. that it started off as like a complete grift, you know. Uh, sorry, Justin. Uh, you know, it, it basically plagiarized the Filecoin white paper, I and mean, this thing looked like a pure money grab. Yet, over time, in comparing it to um, the, uh, the, you know, sort of like the subcategory of like um, all of these like Chinese like L1s uh, and chains, Tron ended up protecting shareholder value, quote unquote, better than all of these guys, right? It did better than Neo. Did better than Qtum. Uh, did better than all these other Chinese projects, Elastos, um, you know, a whole bunch of others, right? Um, so Ontology, all these other guys. So in some sense, they you know they kind of clean themselves up. They're a bit more legitimate. I still see it as fairly grifty, but it's at least an example. I, I yeah, I honestly I would still put it into Quadrant Four, but I I at least have to admit that it's a project that has been moving left in quadrant four. It started off on the extreme, or I mean, it started <laughs> off on the extreme right side of quadrant four and started moving towards the left, right? <laughs> Maybe down and to the left, you know? Mm -hmm. So I guess credit to them. I mean, I, I don't want to hold that coin, but it, you know, they protected shareholder value pretty well, I think in, uh, in this recent drop you know, in the crypto market, better mm -hmm. than a lot of coins that are more legitimate than it. Uh, let's just say. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, where would you put meme coins in this framework? Uh, it depends on the kind of meme coin, right? Like, well, let's start with Doge. Um, I would say that. Ah, uh, that's kind of hard to say, because like on one hand, it kind of started off. I don't even think it's that grifty, right? Like, the whole thing was a joke. I don't think. You know jackson palmer thought it would even get as big as it did um so i don't even think his intention was just to make a whole bunch of money on it so i'd say it's on the lower grip side um and i think in some ways it's not very utopian either because it doesn't really promise much either right it doesn't really try to solve that many problems it's just a fun little coin right so i would even say maybe even just quadrant one you know that mm. i don't think the intentions were bad when it started and i don't think it tries to do anything beyond its capabilities i don't think its reach is beyond its grasp so maybe just even quadrant one maybe even in some ways even less utopian than bitcoin because it doesn't purport to do like to take over like you know to, to the reserve currency of the world it doesn't purport to do that right so not bad i actually kind of like doge to be honest you know i think fundamentally it's not even that bad you know? would you adjust that vision given that Elon is trying to inject utopianism into it, at least by memeing that into existence? I don't think he's trying that hard because I think at the end of the day, he still understands that it's like a meme joke coin. Um, right. He, so I think he's trying to give it a little bit more utility. I think he's, you know, he's doing it a little bit, but I don't, I think there's only to some extent that he can because of kind of like its origin story. It's, a, you know, it's conception story, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I think it's only so far you can go with that uh, in that direction. But I think it's fine. I think it's fine how it is. You know, um, may, maybe even like to, to talk maybe a little bit about like NFT land, right? For example, I find um, Ether Rocks to be the least utopian, right? Because it almost parts the veil, right? It pulls back the curtain on like, what is it really, right? It doesn't even try to pretend to be more than it is. It literally says like you have a pet rock. You have a you have the you have a pet image of a rock, right? <laughs> and I, I kind of like that, you know. Like if they don't, there's no there's no company behind it that's trying to like pump up its value. There's there's nobody behind it to try and give it some kind of use or oh you get to attend certain parties because you own an ether rock, you know, stuff like that. No, it doesn't matter. It's just it's just a rock. It's just a you know left or right face. I forget which which way it faces. I think it's I don't remember which direction it faces. It's just a left or right facing rock that does nothing, right? So I kind of like that. Very low in utopianism. I think CryptoPunks is a little bit more utopian than it, but still fairly un, not utopian. But I find like Apes to be probably of the three the most utopian, right? Um, so it's like, and I think. And I think these are all fairly like medium level, I think, on the grifty 
scale, right? Because like on one hand, NFTs generally are good at grabbing money, right? Um, and there's always some kind of financial incentive there. Um, but I think it's not that bad in the sense that they don't, they don't really promise too much, right? It's like you really are buying like this JPEG, right? And it's not like they're, it's not like some elaborate contraption, right? Uh, to fool people, right? I think it's in some ways fairly honest, right? So it's in like an, it's like an honest money grab, right? So <laughs> medium grift and varying levels of utopianism. That's kind of how I see um, NFTs. Okay. Yeah. So where would you place stable coins here? Uh, depends what kind of stable coins. I think algo stable coins are ultra utopian. I think there are very few things that are more utopian than uh, pure algo stable coins. Mm. Um, and then whether or not it's grifty or not, I think really grift is more about like intention, right? Like some of these guys are real true believers. Um, now, I think sometimes when the financial incentive is there, people purposely bury their head in the sand to avoid culpability later on, right? Mm -hmm. Like deep down in their subconscious, they know it doesn't work, but consciously they convince themselves that it does work so that their conscience is clean as they promote these things, right? Sure. Um, so I think that's what's happening with a lot of algo stable coins. And I also think that um, there's an effect of VC capital on the uh, prevalence of these attempts at algo stable coins. Because for a lot of VCs, the, you know, the biggest winner accounts for a huge percentage of their entire portfolio, right? Probably like half the returns of the entire portfolio or more are from like a single project. Um, so for them, they're always just looking for home runs. They're looking for projects which um, they're thinking to themselves, does this have the potential to possibly return the entire fund, right? And many multiples on top of that. And the great thing about algo stable coins is that the total addressable market is extremely, extremely big. The success rate of it only needs to be like very, very small for it to be like very EV positive for them and for it to be like a venture bet. And because of that, it causes huge over allocation of venture capital into these kinds of projects, right? Because the incentives of the VCs are there and the incentives of the founders are there because the TAM is so huge, right? Um, and I think that this is kind of a problem. But that being said, now that we've seen that the algo, algo, algo stable experiment sort of failed, are VCs going to continue to invest in this way or do you think that they're not going to touch it anymore? Um, I think there has been a chilling effect on, um, on financing these things, but I think the incentives are there for that to return eventually. So like mm. another two years, three years, probably people can try it again. So um, you think something, another algo stable is going to emerge and try to do this thing again. And they're just, yeah, they're just going to say, but this time it's different. <laughs> yeah. I think they're going to say this time it's different. And I think this time it's going to be the same. Um, yeah. I think the only way that this changes is if there is enough social pressure on VCs um, that it uh, compensates them for, uh, you know, this being like the perfect type of venture bet, right? Uh, or a very accurate um, assessment of the probability of it actually succeeding, uh, which is so low that even with the TAM, it's not profitable for the VC. I do think there's going to be less financing of this stuff going forward. Every cycle, every cycle is going to be some. And eventually people are just going to say, yeah, there's just no way to make this thing work. It really is trying to build a perpetual motion machine. And for the most part, reasonable people today do not try to build perpetual motion machines, right? Like in the physical world, right? Like if you pitch a VC, I finally constructed a perpetual motion machine. Generally, they would not fund it, right? Though to be, you know, it, it's TAM would be huge, right? If you could actually make a perpetual motion machine, it's TAM is insanely big, right? Um, but I think at some point the VCs realize the probability actually is virtually zero, such that the product is extremely negative, EV, right? Right. Um, so that that realization I think has to come um, at some point about these algo stable coins, in my opinion. 
and I, of course I could just be wrong if someone figures it out, right? But I mean, uh, on this one, I don't think so, but you know, we'll see, I could be wrong. If you look at the history of the space, um, that a lot of the misallocation of capital is in some ways unavoidable um, because there's sort of a meta layer of incentives around all of this stuff. And it, and it starts from like the very top of where like the capital is originated, right? Which is sort of like, you know, these like uh, uh, capital allocators, these large like endowments, uh, family offices, fund of funds, right? These LPs, basically limited partners, right? In these venture funds. And the stories that are sold to them for the viability of the venture fund itself, and then the venture fund having their own incentives, trying to maximize their carry, buying into um, sort of like the mentality of Silicon Valley um, and like these power law kind of returns, and then searching out the types of projects uh, that are like that, and then supply being created to meet that demand of this influx of new capital, right? Like when you look at the entire chain of capital and all the different incentives along the way, it almost seems like it's impossible to avoid all of the um, misallocated capital that has happened in the space, right? So in that way, it's not really a bad thing. It's just the natural course of things that we have to go through for eventually people to change their own um, expectations and perceptions, right? Like for, for example, as LPs become more sophisticated themselves, that has effects that flow through down to the types of companies that VCs invest into, right? Because a lot of the VCs themselves are running grifts on um, their investors, right? Because their investors are less specialized than them into this sector, right? So it's much easier for them to sell the wild gargantuan narratives than it is for them to talk about like revenue generating businesses, uh, for example, right? Because crypto is so new and hip and cool, right? That it kind of should be that way, you know, otherwise the, the um, capital allocators themselves, the LPs um, could just do it themselves, right? If it's not something that's so wild and crazy, then, uh, then the VCs will lose a lot of allocation uh, because the LPs, as they get smarter, realize they could do it themselves, right? And then I would also say that, like, um, you know, as the um, LPs get smarter also, maybe they also realize, well, wait a second, like, maybe it doesn't actually make sense, um, you know, for investing into some of these, like, really crazy, like, reflexive projects, right? Or historically, like, a lot of people um, have taken losses, right? Um, if they themselves through the VC take a lot of losses, but that can only happen if the VC is not out early, right? For these super reflexive mechanisms so far, the reason that they're going to repeat is that a lot of people still made a lot of money on Luna, right? And it was mostly the end bag holders that lost money. So the end bag holders learned the lesson of maybe this stuff won't work again, right? But the people who made money will be willing to invest into these kinds of things again, right? But eventually the market corrects itself because with the final exit liquidity no longer participating, it pushes forward the inevitable collapse of these kinds of reflexive mechanisms. Because now, instead of like retail holding the bag, now the last round investor is going to hold the bag the next time it's tried. And now after that, those guys exit and they've learned their lesson. Now it'll be the second to last round investors that'll take the loss and hold the bag the next time around, right? So eventually the market corrects for itself and eventually the LPs themselves take losses on it and then uh, don't invest into funds uh, that engage in these kinds of allocations, right? And in, in, in these kinds of investments. So it just takes time. It takes multiple cycles, right? Because in some ways, people are not able to pull expectations forward. Within the population, there is like, uh, a lot of different levels of thinking, right? There's like level zero, level one, level two, um, you know, that kind of thinking, uh, different, these different like meta layers. And the population is distributed across all these levels, right? So from what I've seen, some people are able to pull expectations forward and some people are not in the sense that there, there are some people that can only learn from experiencing it, it in and of itself. And some people who 
can learn from pulling abstractly expectations forward, right? So like for, for, for example, an easy way to see this is that like, um, let's say you think like the Ethereum merge is like a sell the news event, right? Um, so you plan to sell your ether, right? So a level zero thinking would be, okay, well, you know, after the merge happens, right after that, I'm going to start selling my ether, right? Well, level one thinking might be, well, I know that other people are thinking this and they're going to sell after the merge. So right before the merge, I'm going to sell, right? And then level two might be, well, I know that some people think that after the merge, they're going to, some people are after the merge, they're going to sell. Some people right before the merge, they're going to sell. So I'm going to sell a week before the merge, right? So it's like you have all these different levels. Now you don't want to level yourself, right? Because if you go too early, <clears throat> then you kind of miss the, uh, you know, you, you miss the target there. So really the, the entire game is to figure out like in a kind of like Keynesian beauty contest, like it's like a, it's like those, those, those games that they play in like college where it's like professor brings in like a marble of jars and he says, okay, I want everybody to write down um, what they think the, av the average guess will be for two thirds of the number of marbles in the jar or like how many marbles are going to be in this jar. I think that's an even easier example. I want you guys to guess as to the average guess as to like two thirds of how many marbles are going to be in the jar, right? So it's like this kind of like um, meta game. Within the space, learning happens at these kinds of levels, right? There's like level zero learning where after an event, we're able to learn from it, right? There's like level one where it's like you kind of see it coming and there, therefore you can learn from it, right? So in this case with like the VCs and, and the LPs, for some of them, they viscerally need to take a loss of capital for them not to make these types of investments again. For others, mm -hmm. they're able to see what's coming, that eventually these things will not work, and thus they um, stop investing into them, right? So it's like, it's a mix of those things. And that's why I do think that eventually things get better, but it takes multiple cycles. And it doesn't, it's like one blow up is not enough. Like Luna's blow up is not enough for this experiment not to be tried again. It still will be tried again, but eventually, eventually it will stop being tried. Final things that I want to talk about are the ETHPOW uh, base fee redirection of EIP-1559 to uh, multisig, then your take on the LUNK 1.2% burn tax. So I think for, for ETHPOW, I think, um, I, I don't really like what they're doing over there. Um, meaning that like, if I, if I were in charge of doing like, an ETH POW fork uh, at that time, I would have not have made the choices that they made. Now, I understand why they made those choices, right? Like at the end of the day, they don't have an Ethereum foundation, so they don't have a way to fund development on their chain, right? Um, so they're trying to figure out a way of doing it. But putting like the base fee from EIP-1559 into some kind of centrally controlled multi-sig for development purposes, that's just very centralized, right? Then it's just very clear that there's like some small group um, that uh, gets control over, you know, this pool of capital. And I don't think that that's the line that they should have played. I think they should have played a much cleaner and much more kind of fair line, right? Where maybe initially some people have to just take some, altruistically have to take some short-term losses. They have to do development work for no, uh, for no pay, uh, you know, this, this, and that. Miners might have to mine at a loss for a little while, this, this, and that. I think the conception story is extremely important. And I think a lot of the sort of, the the dirtiness that surrounds ETH Pow, I think will stay with them for an extremely long time, if not their entire life. Um, so I think they made a lot of misplays. Any any time where there is some kind of centralization, I think they um, should not have gone down that road. I, I, I think their narrative should have been that ETH POS is going to become more centralized. It, it's controlled by the Ethereum Foundation. That's how they're able to actually fork off of it. I think probably in retrospect, I didn't have this thought at the time, Probably they should have just forked um, by keeping the chain exactly the same with virtually no changes, maybe with the chain ID uh, changed, right? Without even diffusing the difficulty bomb. And only later on in an upgrade, quote unquote upgrade, diffuse the difficulty bomb, right? So that they can at least have a story that this Ethereum, that's this proof of work Ethereum, is exactly the same Ethereum that we all know and that we all use, which is the pre fork right? That there's absolutely no changes, maybe with the exception of, of the chain ID, right? And I think that would have been a stronger play. Um, it's what I would have recommended to them at the time if I was working for them. This is why all these conspiracy theories, you know, 
about that. Oh, I'm in, I'm in the ETH proof of work camp. Uh, not the case. They, they, they're not paying me. I don't work for them. Um, they clearly did things that clearly I would have never done. I've never played my hand that way. Um, and, uh, you know, so they've decided to do what they want to do. That's their prerogative. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see how, how things turn out. Um, the market's uh, pricing things at, what, like eight bucks or something like that. You know, there's been a lot of dumping. We'll see where things go. You're saying that this was already implemented and all of the base fees from ETH, ETH POW are being redirected into a multi-sig? Yeah, I mean, that's my understanding of, of how their um, how their fork works. Yeah. They okay. defeat the difficulty bomb. They redirect the fees. I think did, I think they were thinking about freezing the DeFi protocols. Um, yeah, that was that was clearly a bad idea. I think it's gladly, I think, <laughs> for their sake, uh, they decided not to do that. Um, oh, is that true? So I read the Ave governance proposal, and it, it looked like it was passing from when I last looked at it. Oh, I, I, I think maybe that's just for Ave itself to like stop like deposits and withdrawals or borrows and lends during that time. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't been following that too closely, but I know that um, the ETH POW guys were at, was at some point they were seriously considering freezing like a ton of DeFi protocols basically. So that oh, like all of it, what, like all of almost all of it, basically. And I think that's clearly a mistake, um, which I think they recognize later. Who who are the guys behind ETH POW now? I think it's mostly like the miners, Chandler Grove, miners. the AWSB. Um, you know, mostly those guys. Uh, they have like a decent, I think, Chinese community. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't really, I've never, I've never talked to Chandler since like 2014. So, you know, I don't really know what's going on. Over there. There's all these conspiracy theories. It's so funny, you know. It, you know, I also see on Twitter this whole thing. That it's just like people are saying that I've been like shilling ETH POW. If you literally look at the stuff that I wrote, like what did I even say? I said that like ETH POW's value is strictly greater than zero, which it is, right? Which is why I made the whole backwardation play <laughs> on spot and futures, right? And uh, I played the uh, ST ETH, ETH um, discount also. Right. Also, because of the same reason, because there will be a non-zero value uh, to this to this fork or these multiple forks, which also played out. Uh, and then I said, uh, I want to short Ethereum against Bitcoin because it's run up too much and the narrative is way out of control. Uh, too many people believe in the narrative. And then I closed it out and I was actually flat going into the merge. So I don't understand uh, what, what, what people are even talking about. And I, I want to say, you know, another funny thing about it, too, is that like like. A lot of these kinds of trades are actually really easy, right? Because it's kind of like common sense. Like the only reason that people didn't realize it is because there was too much propaganda, right? Like now when we reflect back, everybody would agree that that's obvious, right? Like that it couldn't have probably even gone any other way that for sure a fork would have more than zero value, right? And that narrative was out of control in the sense that literally everybody that you talk to, maybe with the exception of like Andrew Kang, right? But every influencer you talk to um, was super bullish and in going into the merge, right? At least like three weeks before the merge, right? At, at the time when narrative hit its peak, right? And the trade is simple, which is that anytime virtually everybody believes something, just do the opposite. It's almost guaranteed to be profitable, right? Like. It doesn't even matter if like your chances are super low, right? Like if 99% of the capital is mega long something and then you short, you're, 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 the downside asymmetry is like one to a hundred, right? You only got to be right like one out of a hundred times you probably make money, right? So it's just like whenever things get way too skewed, right? Like, and, and I'm saying like, like, I think like even like 90, 10 is not like skewed enough, right? Like, I mean, like when it's like 99, one or 99.91, like just do the opposite it's like basically like free money basically you know mm -hmm. like it, it, it doesn't even matter like in the long term whether it's correct or not right it's just like when like it's so fragile in one direction it's almost like a super super cheap call option it's like you're basically able to buy a virtually free mm -hmm. call option right that's like almost certainly good like somebody's just mispricing it because somebody the rest of the market is selling you a call option at virtually free right mm -hmm. So, so, so is that what you did? So you, you, what you, you borrowed Steth and then traded it for ETH and then shorted ETH and bought more Bitcoin. And that's where you hold Bitcoin. Well, there were, there were three things. Uh, well, there was actually, there was more things, but at least publicly um, that I've talked about, there were three things, right? So the first was uh, 
and I think I was literally the first to do it, uh, which was a uh, uh, long spot, or one of the first, well, long spot, uh, short uh, September or December quarterlies on ETH. Um, uh, short ST ETH against ETH. Uh, that was the second thing. And then later on, and this is actually later on, because um, then everybody started piling into those trades. Mm -hmm. And once again, if everybody is doing a thing, right? Like, I don't think it got to like 99%, but like if 99% of the capital was like on, on the side of doing this, like, uh, you know, a backward data basis play, and then only 1% was doing the basis play, I would have flipped my position. I would have just taken the opposite position because once again, you just absolutely don't want to do what 99% of people are doing. Like I would literally have done the opposite of my own, uh, of my own public play if everybody was doing it. You know what I mean? Um, so, but so th those were the two uh, first two. And then later on, I did uh, the ETH short against Bitcoin. Um, and actually, I, I think the hedge with Bitcoin maybe was not the best hedge. I was actually also thinking about like Dogecoin or just like equities uh, or like uh, Litecoin, something like that. I eventually actually did end up making a, a Litecoin play, which you know, worked uh, pretty well. Um, but it's like uh, finally found a use for Litecoin, which is that if you need a beta hedge to anything in the space and you can't use Bitcoin because there's idiosyncratic stuff like empty Gox coins going to be released uh, for Bitcoin, then maybe Litecoin has a value, right? It's like it's like it's no other value besides serving as a bait hedge when you can't use Bitcoin. Well, fine, maybe then there's still something there, right? So that's kind of what I figured out about Litecoin recently. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of what I what I did, um, and uh, yeah, all of that played out. And we actually went into the merge um, uh, completely flat. Um, I was a bit uh, pessimistic in the sense that I did think it was a sell the news event, but my conviction wasn't strong enough uh, to just outright short it. Especially, and, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's actually because of uh, Luna C uh, pumping like crazy, right? Lunk uh, popping like crazy, right? Because what I was thinking is that there's no way this narrative of like uh, ultrasound money is strong enough to curb the rotation of, uh, of, of mercenary capital, right? But then like I saw like Lunk, right? And they said, we're going to tack on like a 1.2, 1.4, I forget how much it is, transaction tax on chain, right? And we're going to make it deflationary. Right. And it's terrible. I mean, like the, the, you, you're just moving numbers around. This is, it doesn't change anything fundamentally. Right. You, whatever you do, like you're just like shifting shit around. Um, so there's no way that that could work. Right. Yet price pumped, not just a little bit, but price pumped insanely. Right. And I thought off of such a stupid narrative, it can pump that much. Like maybe I'm just trying to pick up pennies in front of steamroller here. I better get out of the way. Maybe this, maybe this narrative thing is just way too strong. This ultra ultrasound money, as if the supply side even mattered in in the current times, right? It's all it's all demand driven anyway. Like how much of price is driven by demand? Like 90, 99 percent? Who knows? Like tons, right? Uh, supply is just like a rounding error on that uh, on, on you know what, what what actually affects price, right? But like, could people believe it? Like maybe I mean like lunk popped like crazy. So like, do I really even want to risk it? So I was like, oh maybe I better I better not short. So actually, in some ways, uh, you know, the, the lunatics got the revenge on me because they actually prevented me from making money. If it wasn't for their coin popping, probably would have uh, would have shorted uh, Ethereum into the verge and uh, you know, made, made a nice bit of it. So you know, fairly ironic how all that, all that works out, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> do, do, you, do you think that um, there is a role for ETC in the future of ETHPOW as this plays itself out, uh, given yeah. that, sorry, ETHPOS, um, given that ETHPOW has kind of diverged from the original ethos uh, and governance of, of ETH1 and ETC kind of has persisted, but without all of the apps that, that existed on ETH1? Yeah, you know what I think is that I think ETC and ETHPOW are going to be uh, very close competitors. And um, because they're both like um, kind of like unbuilt out versions of ETH and they have to compete with each other on hash rate, which has, um, you know, there, there's always this whole thing, this price drive hash rate, this hash rate drive price. It's really circular, right? Like the whole thing is like uh, reflexive on itself, right? So um, they drive each other in a way, right? Um, so, um, so they're going to compete with each other a lot on both price and, and hash power. I actually think that both of them compete less with ETH POS than they do with each other. And I think it'll be interesting to see how that uh, battle plays out. Right now, there's still some competition between ETH POW and ETH POS, uh, just because like we're so close after like the merge. 
But eventually, that competition will just start dying off, and then it'll just mostly be between ETC and ETH Pal. Is ETH Pal currently overpriced at this target, given that uh, most development activity is moving off of it? Uh, I don't make any price predictions about things. You know, m most of uh, most of like my, my ideas that. Um, I want to, you know, be public about. I just put on Twitter. Like, I'm, I'm very careful about not shilling uh, things, um, you know, on, on public venues, on public platforms. Um, so I don't have a, a very strong opinion about Keith Powell. Uh, I will say that for us, what we did is that in the first block, we we're able to win the gas auction and uh, dump a lot of e e proof of work ERC twenty coins for ETH Pal, ended up with a bunch of that and sold that off very quickly. So that's what we did. Currently, we don't hold any ETH Pal. Will that prevent us from holding it in the future or even expressing a short bet on it? No, uh, but I think you know we're waiting to see right now. I'm not too keen to buy. I'm not too keen to sell right now. Um, at, a, at a certain price, if it's too low, I would be a buyer. And if there's a price, if it's too high, I'd be a seller. So it's between those two prices right now. So we're flat. Okay. If and when the Zerg overrun ire, may the Kalal Protoss finally sever their cords, shun the Kala, and don their cloaks. We will be here to welcome them to Shakuris. Even though they are ingrates, uh, they are still our brethren. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, the analogy that I drew recently, the reason I use this particular analogy, um, is because the thing, the issue that I really had with the merge um, isn't really that it was going to happen. It was more about the narrative that surrounded it. And there was something of that narrative flavor which reminded me of Luna. Once again, I'm not saying Ethereum is anything like Luna. It is way, way better. It's night and day compared to Luna. But there's something about the marketing effort, right, and the narrative that surrounds these types of events that there's something toxic and cancerous within the space that needs to be ruled out. And I think really the thing that I put my finger on is it's like this, the narrative construction itself, right? The idea of creating narrative to create exit um, liquidity for long investors, VCs and founders to dump on retail. This is extremely unhealthy. Um, and I think that until that stops, we, we can't really get like another bull run, right? Because continually the sentiment within retail is that they get ripped off over and over and over again, and it's not stopping. And there needs to be kind of like a quiet period where they stop getting ripped off, and then they develop the courage again to come back into the market, to spur on the next bull run, right? So that's why I think you know a lot of these narratives are just not very healthy. And when I talk about the protoss, um, the Kali Protoss, which are the light Protoss, uh, and then uh, the Nerazim, which are the dark Protoss, the difference between them is that the, initially the Protoss, they were all um, kind of like telepathically linked through, uh, basically they had these cords on the back of their head that allow them to be telepathically linked and hence have like kind of like um, telepathy and a shared hive mind. And... Um, that what I'm saying is that that's a little bit like narrative. It's like this kind of like hive behavior, this herd behavior, this kind of like tribal behavior that's very very unhealthy. And some of the protons decided that they didn't. They wanted to be individuals. They no longer wanted to just be part of the collective, and they severed their cords and thus you know were their own person. And they were banished for their independent thought, for their heresy, right? Because they're a very religious kind of race, for their heresy off of the home world of ire to basically the shadow world uh, called Shakuras, right? Um, and what I'm saying is that in order for us to do better as an industry, not just for the sake of retail, but also for our own sake, we need to stop having these kinds of like grand overarching narratives that will always end up failing to deliver, always end up disappointing, right? And causing these kinds of um, huge losses of money, people killing themselves, stuff like that. Right? Um, so I think that can only happen with a lot more independent thought where people are not afraid 
to go against the grain. I'm not afraid to speak out against things that are hard to speak out about, right? Like for the most part, there's a lot of easy targets out there, right? <clears throat> like people generally hate Cardano. People generally hate Ripple. You know, people hate this, this, and that. But that's easy, right? Because everybody's kind of in, in agreement. What are some things which we're not thinking of right now? What is truly something that's contrarian without, within the space, right? That nobody oh, wants I to hear that people will skewer you for, for even suggesting. And it's these holy cows that we must take down, right? Um, and I think that's really, I think that's what's really important for the long, long term um, success of the space. I want to uh, make a distinction between marketing and narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think marketing is fine. I think it is important that projects market themselves. Um, but I think it's it about how they do the marketing and whether that creates a narrative. Like, what was really the issue with the Luna narrative? Well, the issue is, well, there's twofold. One is that Anchor is safe, right? That you can, you, that you can actually get 20% on your money without taking much risk, right? And the second is that UST is stable, right? Like this, this just ended up being incorrect, right? Now, what was like sort of like the narrative around the merge? It's that the merge was not priced in, that it will pump afterwards, right? I think it's one thing to do marketing and to say, you know, here are all the merits of this thing. Here are the things that we're trying to achieve. It's another thing to say, we are doing this thing, therefore we think price is going to go up, right? Mm -hmm. Anytime there's a narrative which appeals to people's greed, right, I think is very, very unhealthy, right? Um, that usually ends up, ends in tears, right? Mm -hmm. So I think like we should be very careful when we talk about price, right? We should talk more about the tech. We should actually just be more in it for the tech and reflect that in the language that we use. If you noticed on my Twitter, for example, and a lot of times when I'm on podcast, I'm very, very careful about talking about price for exactly this reason, because I don't want to mislead people to accidentally lose their money, right? Like, even, even if I believe in it, right? Like, even if I actually think price is going to go up, and price is going to go down. Like, I don't want to, like, mislead people, right, accidentally. And I think people in the crypto space, people with a lot of influence, a lot of followers, they're way more than me, right? Way more than me. They're much too cavalier about how they talk about things, especially when it comes to price. The the other adverse incentive at play here is also YouTubers. Um, I mean, you know, I'm I'm post posting this on YouTube, obviously, because it's a great distribution medium. But that being said, there's all these new influencers that have come in in 2020 and 2021 with hundreds of thousands of subscribers sort of pivoting their channel to cryptocurrency and then basically making a 10 minute video about the price action of some coin mm -hmm. whose coin project in the background has paid them you know a sum of money to 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 make that video you know how do you how do you solve that problem and, you know, the uh, thing I don't think that's solvable I, I actually don't think that's solvable right. I, I think, um, that only gets solved by the market itself in the super long term. When eventually these people lose reputation, they basically monetize their influence for payment, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually um, people get burned on it. These people are no longer as influential and then things move on. And then there'll be a new crop of people doing the same thing. But yeah. eventually re retail itself just gets smarter and eventually realizes, well, maybe I shouldn't listen to any YouTube influencers about price, right? Or I should really think about it myself too and do the research myself, right? Um, so eventually it gets better but we're, we're gonna have to go through a couple of yeah steps. yeah it only took yeah. it only took the market 10 plus years to realize jim kramer is just trading against them <laughs> probably longer than that honestly yeah. probably longer than that i don't even know if like the entire normie crowd uh even understands that yet right but over time it, just, it takes it takes a lot of time um and i would also say the one thing that helps is that for a lot of the crypto ogs and the old heads for them to have at least some kind of, let's say, social consensus, right? That like this kind of behavior is not good, right? That like we should all try and do the cooperate, cooperate uh, outcome instead of the defect, defect outcome, right? 
like like for example i don't have that much of a following but right now like i could probably run a grift right like because people know that i called luna correctly that for the most part i'm not as correct but for the most part called the merge correctly and at least the plays that i suggested made money i could literally pick any coin right now and probably say hey i think we should just all buy this coin right or i'm gonna buy this coin right um but that would be irresponsible right i i would say first of all i would ask all of the influencers to first consider their own perspective, which is that, is their reputation only worth that much, right? That they're just gonna monetize it, that like they're basically gonna flip the switch into monetization when there's so much growth left in Silicon Valley terms, right? Should, should they really just monetize it now uh, when crypto is gonna be a multi-century kind of thing, right? That, like most of us believe, right? Um, and the second thing I would say is besides your, your, your considerations, uh, for your own personal interests, um, because the space is giving you so much, because you know th these folks are in such positions of power already, most of them are already very wealthy. How much more money do you need, really? You know, like maybe try and do something, give back a little bit. You know, not just run another grift and pump another coin. You know, you've already made it. You know, and probably you know you're gonna get away. I mean, for the ones that did those pump, most of them are just gonna get away with it anyway, right? So. You know, at this point, you know, why not, um, you know, try and give back and maybe there's something more to, than just doing another grip and making another pile, another buck. Like, what mm -hmm. can you do you can't do already, right? And then on yeah. top of that, if there is a way to socially coordinate for a cooperate, cooperate situation where we shame people for pumping things um, that are just really bad, right? Um, then like, and to some extent it's already there, right? Because like the really, really bad stuff, like everybody shames them for, right? But I'm saying like, we should have a higher standard for ourselves, even more than we have today, right? And maybe then we can actually be, you know, a self-regulated industry, right? And I think that would be a good outcome for everybody, even though individually there are incentives to defect. That would, I mean, that being said, I am happy to monetize. If anybody wants some consulting, I'll collect a <laughs> consulting fee. You know, don't get me wrong. Right? I'll take my five mil. Don't don't get me wrong. <laughs> But I will never try to create exit liquidity by bottom feeding off a of retail. It's just shameful. The whole thing is just shameful. I mean, it really calls the question because now I think about it. The people who do that are the people without the skills and the talent to make money otherwise, yeah. right? Without better and more honorable ways of making money, that's the only thing they can do. That's why they do it. They know it's frowned upon, right? So if anything, it calls into question these people's character and their ability and their competence. And I think right. that's the line that we should have. I think that should be the new narrative. If you grift on retail, it's because you are too incompetent to make money otherwise. Mm -hmm. Let that be the new narrative. I think that will be a healthy narrative. Okay. Well, here's the thing. I, I don't see too many of the old heads doing that uh, outside of maybe Richard Hart that I could think of uh, off the top of my head. Um, but they're, they're, the, the ones that are are on TikTok. They've just garnered a huge following on TikTok and want projects to pay them x amount of dollars for each post you know yeah it just that just can't be helped you know we just have to deal with it and we'll, we should just call it out where we see it because there were TikTok people that that i reached out to because i said okay like you should you should be aware of this project you know maybe you want to do something about it and then she just slapped me with like a point by point thing you know if you wanted to purchase a la carte this post or if you wanted you know five posts is this much if you this 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 <laughs> it's like that, like a menu. Yep. Um, yeah, that's how it goes. I mean, I, I think to some extent the OGs are already, you know, against that kind of stuff. Uh, but what I'm saying is to have even higher standards. Now. So some of that is unavoidable. Like th th there, there's no way to get them into social consensus. I mean, I think mean, to some extent, here's what I would say, which is that like even in the, like within the CT circle, right? These influencers don't like losing influence to some random TikTok person, right? So mm -hmm. even for one, from a moral standpoint, ethical standpoint, they're against it. But two, even from their own self-interest in the power that they hold on influence, they don't like some random TikToker, um, you know, undermining them on, on that, right? And taking market share from that. So like, there's, I think there's no real issue there. And where there is an issue, we can't really solve it. It just has to play itself out. But I think there's a there's another issue because it brings a different issue into mind, which is um, about 
the unwillingness of people to call things out, right? And there's very good reasons for that, right? There's, there's a lot of incentives at play. If you're a VC, you don't have really that much incentive to call out another VC's project because you're probably going to be in a lot of deals with that person, right? Mm -hmm. you know, some you're going to have different deals with opposing projects. Some you're going to be in the same project, right? You need the deal flow. You need the deal sharing. And hence, everything becomes extremely political, right? And when I have private conversations with people, I know that a lot of these VCs, very reasonable, very smart guys, right? But they can't come out in public and let's say, say that Luna is a bad thing or say mm -hmm. that X, Y, and Z is a bad thing, even though they know it. I mean, they've been around the space almost as long as I have. We've all seen the same shit. We're all on the same page. We, we have all worked at the sausage factory. We've all seen how the sausage is made, right? So like, it's not for a lack of understanding. It's just that there's too many political considerations. But that's what I, that's what I think I mean by saying like to do a public service. A public service is costly, right, personally to you. And to set a good example for other people in the space, because you are an influencer, and because you're an OG, because you've seen, you've been here so long, to try and set a good example for other people, for all the newcomers, so that eventually when the TikToker eventually comes on to CT, gets shamed a little bit, falls in line, and understands what is socially acceptable and what is not socially acceptable. Right? Mm -hmm. So on one hand, the dismantling of holy cows, and on the other hand, the willingness to stick out their neck at personal cost um, and set a good example. That being said, the YouTube personalities with actually no ties in the space do have an advantage uh, because they don't know any of these players and they can just create an expose video with, with no personal ties. You know, I think for the most part, you know, I don't think what, what, what I'm doing, I'm not asking people to like, abandon everything for the cost cause right what i'm saying is just like just once do something which is highly unpopular right that you think is the right thing that goes against the narrative just once everybody just does it once we're already good we're already good everybody just needs to do it once and i think to be fair certain people are in better positions to do it than others like you mentioned the youtuber doesn't really have like a stake in like the court politics of crypto Right. So they're able to do it to some extent. A lot of the, the, the market neutral guys um, trading desks, they also have kind of like less of a stake. Right. Um, once they set up their VC fund, uh, then they have more of a stake not to do these things. Right. Uh, not to say these things. So, like, it's important to look at everybody's incentive and not to blame them too hard for it either. Right. Because, like, at the end of the day, they have fiduciary duty to their investors. Right. And if by sowing bad blood in the space, it causes um, lower returns for their investors, then they've not upheld their duty, right? So I'm not saying that they, they should, you know, just willy nilly just go burn all the bridges, right? I'm just saying, just do one thing where you can, right? Like some people are in better position to do so than others. Um, some are not, uh, but just do one thing and do what you can, you know, like, mm -hmm. so it's understandable, you know, no, no, nobody's really at fault there, right? Incentives drives, drive everything, and they should they should be respecting and obeying their fiduciary duty to their investors and maximizing their returns. Right. So, just wherever you can, you know, where where it doesn't impede on that, uh, where it makes sense, you know. Okay. That being said, I'll close out with the final comment, which is, in what quadrant does Cosmos fall under? Ah, uh, no comment. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not interested in burning bridges. <laughs> it doesn't mean that I think it's actually bad, right? Uh -huh. I just wanted to just throw that out as a joke. So I neither endorse it nor am I a detractor of it. I'm uh, neutral. Okay. Uh, and okay. No further comments. On it. All right. Well, thank you, Kevin, so much. This was a great podcast, and thank you for spending the time telling me all of your insights. This the, I've been I've been wanting to talk to you for quite some time now. So thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really happy to, to have, have been on here. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for the time. <laughs>